joining us from Scotland and been traveling around to get here, and he has a lot of valuable information to share relating to how to heal your body, how to heal yourself. So please give a round of applause to Anthony Samaroff. Thank you, Derek. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank uh, Illuminati Congo for bringing our attention to our breath because as you might know from the program, my talk's entitled The Medical Mafia and some of the stuff I'm going to tell you about might give you cause to want to steady your breathing. <laughs> I always think it's good to start with a laugh because when you get into the reads of what's going on in the world, you sometimes uh, can get a bit negative. I like to say, I'm fighting this with everything I've got, but I'm doing it with a smile on my face. Because if you get depressed, they've already won, and they'll send, sell you some antidepressants which aren't very effective and will have long-term side effects that are bad for you. So, <laughs> you've all heard of blowing smoke up someone's ass, right? But I bet you didn't know that blowing smoke up someone's ass was actually once an accepted medical therapy. In the 18th century, it was believed that the coffee enema could resuscitate people, like drowning victims, for example, and it was commonly practiced along the banks of the Thames River in London, England. Right? In the 19th century, oh, here's another thing. We've heard a lot about quack treatments recently, but I bet you don't know where the term quack doctor comes from. It is believed that, well, quack, the quack doctors in the 19th century, doctors used to prescribe things like arsenic for just about anything that you could think of. And their toxic treatments caused diseases like Bell's palsy, but they put down the side effects to other things, uh, other disease. That never happens these days, is it? Like, it's never, it's never that widespread medical treatments cause side effects and then they say, no, that must be caused by something else. So the, quick, the quicksilver doctors who prescribed arsenic and mercury, which we know to be toxic, um, for just about everything, uh, came to be known as the quick doctors. And in a southern accent, that sounds a little bit like quack doctor. So they say, in the 20th century, there's so many treatments that were mainstream that were later um, found to be uh, ineffective or actually harmful to pa patients. Routinely taking out your tonsils or your um, appendix. How about the frontal lobotomy, electroshock therapy, thalidomide, which caused all those deformed babies, HRT for menopause, um, hormone replacement therapy, bone marrow transplants for ca cancer patients. Um, they used to do the PSA prostate exam for, for prostate cancer until later on they went, oh sorry, it's really, it's, it, it turns out false positives all the time and we just made a bunch of men in com continent or, in, or stop, them for, stop the tube from being able to function a lot. Um, you know, sexually, um, for no reason, right? And this goes on and on. And now, nowadays, you know, how many treatments that they're prescribing now are they going to turn around and saying, oh, I'm sorry, we were just like disfiguring you and making you sicker. Uh, but we've got a new treatment that we know is going to work because the evidence is in the same journal that published the data on the last treatment that we recommended. Because, excuse me, I've documented in my articles incidences of when pharma companies were taken to court and sued over a drug and the regulator was not given all the data, the journals could demand and we'll come back, back to why they don't, all the data, all the raw data, but, but the only time we got all the data was once the drug had caused so much harm that the pharma company was sued 
And the judge said, you've got to open up your books and show us what we're doing, what you're doing here. And then the expert witnesses went through it and went, oh, here's how they manipulated the data. In the case of something, you know, the drug Neurontin Gabapentin, this was being falsely advertised for bipolar, even though their own studies showed that it caused more harm to bipolar patients than good. They were taken to court and sued. Obviously, what they were sued for was a lot less than they made the profits from the drug. But a lot of doctors don't even know that the court case happened because it was barely covered in the media. So they're going on prescribing the drug off-label to bipolar patients, even though it's a demographic for which it does more harm than good. So what I want to talk, so whenever there's a drug scandal, people go, oh, this is the kind of thing that happens from time to time. Life goes on. But the incentive structure of the system doesn't change. So what I wanted to talk about today was when your friends tell you, oh, what, so everyone's in it, the journals, the regulator, the, you know, the, the universities, how, why wouldn't, I want to demonstrate why pharma money is behind all of these institutions and that's why they're all on one side and it's not yours, okay? So, so you, when you understand the logic behind it, you understand. But I also don't want to just get into the negativity of it because there's a story that runs through Eastern mysticism which is this beggar is sitting on a chest and uh, you know, a Baba comes by in his orange robes you know, and he sees the beggar. The, the, the Baba's penniless as well. Right, but he's not poor because he's rich inside. You know, he's got his spirituality. They're both penniless. They both rely on donations. But the, the Baba looks in his pocket, he finds the crusty bread that someone gave to him because he's a priest and gives it to the beggar and says, say, what's that? What's in that chest you're sitting on? And the, the beggar says, oh, it's just a bunch of old rags. And he says, how, how do you know? He's like, well, I've been sitting here for 20 years. Maybe you should check inside again. He's like, I know what's in my chest. I've been sitting here for 20 years. Okay. Off walks the priest and the, the beggar sits there and goes, wow, who does he think he is telling me? I know what's on my chest. I've been sitting here for 20 years begging. He, but it annoys him. So he opens up the chest and he looks at the rags and woven into them are fine threads of gold silk that he never even knew were there the whole time. When you see that America alone is, is um, spending $4 trillion a year on healthcare, if it had a healthcare system similar to Singapore, it might reduce that to $1 trillion a year. We are sitting on a gold mine. So it's the consciousness of the planet when you understand that what's paying for all of this corruption could, with the right shift in consciousness, being turned around to prevent illness rather than treat it. treat Because most of the diseases people are dying from are preventable. I've covered, and if you go to sevenpharmamyths.com and download my free ebook, I'll subscribe you to my Substack, and you can read some of the articles where I cover this stuff. Incidents of programs that prevented heart disease, diabetes, the biggest killers, and the private hospitals had to shut them down because they lost money when they prevented disease. But it shows that when people say, oh, people don't want to change their lifestyle, that might be true in a society where the doctor goes, okay, smoke less, drink less, eat less junk, lose weight, off you go. But if you have community, people can come together and change their habits together, right? So the money's in our hands, it's just going to the wrong people. So, how does this manifest? If you've watched the news in the evening in America, you might be surprised to see that almost all of the ads are pharma ads. Now, I naively believed that this was just to sell drugs. But here's the thing. If pharma companies are paying more money for advertising space 
during the news, what is the news not going to want to cover? They're buying favorable coverage. When I was doing my research, I found out that there was something like 500 w drug withdrawals a year in the United States, wrong dosage on the bottle, um, wh wh um, wh whatever, all sorts of things, where they had to take the drugs back. So if the news wanted to, they could create a pharma scandal every single day of the week. Um, so, so what I wanted to say was, there's a, there's, a, there's a collusion going on between the... Um, does, any, has, does anyone here remember or have heard of the Vioxx scandal? Yeah. So this was an anti-inflammatory drug that caused 140,000 heart attacks and 60,000 deaths because it was advertised as being safer than its competitors when it was actually more dangerous. This kind of shows how it works because... An FDA regulator, Dr. Graham, tried to go against this drug and he was offered a promotion to shut his mouth. He was inside the FDA, but he didn't want to take the bribe, so he kept on talking and they tried to make his life difficult. Both, not only did the regulator have a hand in this, but um, top journals like um, the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association both published favorable articles about this. Someone phoned into the radio when, someone, when a representative of the New England Medical Journal was on the radio, a doctor, and said, this study is no good, you have to pull it. And they said, we can't go about policing every claim we make in our journal. The thing is, the New England Medical Journal made almost a million dollars selling reprints of the misleading article back to Merck, the manufacturer, so they could post it out to doctors to propagandize them to think that this new treatment was safer than existing treatments. So this shows how we are meant to have objective science, but there's a conflict of interest here. If you go on to the, Forbes released an article saying 75% of the FDA's clinical evaluation department's money comes from pharmaceutical industry. And this was meant to save people paying taxes, of course, but no, no, we can rush our drug through the regulator by paying them. And, and, that, and, 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 and so the FDA is in receipt of money. Uh, another article I, I cite, um, researchers at the NH, or people at the NIH, National Institutes of Health, were gaining um, hundreds of thousands of dollars from the pharmaceutical industry. So that's the journals and the regulator. I'll say a little bit more about the journals. Um, you can sell, a, as in the case of Viox, favorable articles back to drug manufacturers. So where is the incentive to print articles that are saying drugs are less safe than originally thought? Who's going to pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars to get up and tell you that these drugs are harmful? So if you really, 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 really right, want to get at the consciousness of people, Doctors are like the social media influencers, if you like, of the, of the drug industry. So not only that, in most states, doctors will have to do 50 hours of continuing medical education a year to keep their license, what I like to call continuing medical indoctrination. Because all of these conferences, continuing medication conferences, who pays for them? Pharma. I had a girlfriend in Mexico City. She's a, doc she's a doctor. She said to me, Anthony, I never go to conferences that aren't funded by pharma. W why would I? Why would she? Why should she put money in her own wallet to, to go out and go to pay? And also think about it. They, they, and I would say deliberately, 
put doctors through this grueling 10 years of education, sometimes working 70, 80 hours, who knows, maybe more than that, uh, not eating, not showering, just doing it. They're hardly getting paid. When they come out, they're six figures, maybe two times six figures in debt. Why shouldn't I go to a nice conference for the weekend with my wife and watch some presentations? I'm not stupid. I know Pfizer are trying to influence me to, to prescribe their drug rather than anyone else's. I'm not going to be influenced by that. Well, the studies show very clearly that you are influenced by that. The more time doctors spend with drug reps or at a continuing education conference, the more likely they are to prescribe that company's drugs. And on the point of drug reps, they shouldn't even exist, okay? Why? What patients want is simple. The best treatment with the fewest side effects at a reasonable cost. I don't mind paying a bit more for it if it's safer and more effective than another treatment. What do pharma reps want? They want doctors to prescribe their company's drugs regardless of whether there's a better treatment, right? So their only function is to muddy up the evidence and make it unclear to doctors what they should be prescribing. The only people that, do that should be advising doctors are impartial authorities who are trying to look at the evidence and get the clearest evidence on the best treatment. But then we might be ab abandoning the project of pharmaceutical medicine altogether. But that's a talk for another time. So, Continuing medication, medical indoctrination paid by pharma, advertising in the news paid by pharma, journals get advertised, pharmaceutical companies advertise in journals. There was, in a, there was an instance in 1993 where, the internal, where a journal posted an extensive R article showing that ads in pharma, in, in, pharma, in medical journals, would mislead doctors into prescribing wrong and subsequently to printing that article, the pharmaceutical article started pulling advertising from that journal. So they'll pull, at, uh, there's another instance where, uh, I can't remember the details, I, I hate uh, saying anecdotes where I can't, um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a country in Africa that started um, that put in emergency measures to allow l the legal manufacture of generic AIDS drugs to save money because there was a lot of AIDS in the country. You can, Team No Virus can uh, turn off their ears for, for, for a moment here. But as long as you get the picture, what happened subsequently to that was the pharmaceutical company said, do you know what, we're not gonna send any drugs to your country. Fuck you. So, so they, so, then, then when you look at Congress, okay, five out of the 20 biggest lobbying groups are medical related. With the first one, the most, the biggest lobbying group is pharma. The second is insurance, which, whole, which includes health insurance. The ninth is the hospital and nursing home industry. The 13th is health professionals themselves. And the 16th is HMO companies. So, what about the universities? Well, medical schools need money too. And even by the 90s, a huge percentage of the money going to fund medical schools was pharma. Academics can get, can get paid huge sums of money to put their names on ghost-written articles, and it looks good for them. Oh, I'm published in this journal. You can get a huge amount of money and get put on a speaking tour you'll get sent to speaker training, four figures of speaking engagement. If you're a high writer, that's an industry term for, um, for someone who prescribes a lot. Um, so uh, you, as an academic, because if the pharma company says our drug's good, that's just advertising. But if you get the great Dr. Hippocrates at the Institute of Medicine in such and such a country, that looks like it's bona fide. 
So then, then last of all, you have these advocacy groups like the American Cancer Society. A whole book was written on all of the ways that they just don't talk about preventing cancer at all. Their main thing is to encourage people to go to more screenings. 200 to 800 billion, depending on what official source you look at, on unnecessary tests a year in the USA. Sometimes the only reason why doctors sent people to unnecessary tests was to save a hospital bed. I will just send them for some tests. Other times it's defensive. I don't want to get sued. I could do a whole talk on unnecessary tests. 200 to 800 billion, but they're making tremendous sums of money from testing. So when you look, what these groups do is they advise the National Institutes of Health or the CDC on what they think, who, who they think statins should be prescribed for, say it's, uh, you know, the high blood pressure or, or whatever you have. But the problem is that creates a node of a central, central power. All, all you need to do is then once you've got the Multiple Sclerosis Society of America, you're a pharma company, you start saying, well, this is a good cause. You know, they're advising multiple sclerosis companies, um, patients. We'll just put a little bit of money behind them, shall we? And then one by one, the people on the boards of these companies start being replaced by people who've le left pharma companies or by people who are fa favorable to pharma companies. Look, we'll help you set up. We'll help you get branches in more cities will help fund your newsletter so that you can inform more people. Now, when you look at um, Dr. John Abramson, the author of Overdosed America and Sickening, two really good books, he found that eight out of nine of the panel members that were uh, setting the guidelines for statins had ties to industry, ties to industry. Now you will get recommended to be put on a statin if you're just above a certain age, right? The problem with pharmaceutical medicine is you can only treat people when they're sick, right? Wouldn't it be great if you just identified a bunch of markers that maybe they might get sick at some time and you go, well, we better put you on a blood pressure medication just in case, right? Pretty much, if you've not already had a heart attack, if you're not already heart, this is not medical advice. This is merely a matter of style. Don't sue me. From what I can see, from what the experts say, unless you've already had a heart attack, it's pr or cardiovascular event, it's a bad idea to take a statin. So the same happened with insulin. They're spending so much in most industries. As the technology progresses, the price of things comes down. Why is it that we've got the greatest medical technology in the world, but we just keep on spending more and more money on healthcare? Why is it that insulin is more expensive now than it was 20, 30 years? They keep telling you, oh no, this is the great new insulin. And the consumer advocacy groups say, yeah, this is the great, this is the great new insulin. Why? Because everyone on those boards is funded or by the pharmaceutical industry, and that's how they're making money. So they're all on one side, and it's not yours. But the great thing is, you're on your side, and we are all on one another's side. So let me see how we're doing. I'm just coming up to the end. I like to like uh, end on something positive, uh, but I don't have anything. We're all fucked, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really encouraged when we come to get like, I, I've been researching this stuff for a couple of years. You can download my free ebook. I was hoping to have a paperback book ready for this. When we look at the human organism, In a physical level, it's just a bunch of flowing tubes. You've got these tubes that take in air, 
as we just talked about. You've got um, veins and arteries when you, which pump, pump your blood. You've got this big long tube that goes all through here, tubes in here. Don't stick your fingers in your neighbor's tubes. They might get uh, irritated with you. Um, you know, we used to do that when we were at school, wick your thumb and put it in someone's ear. Okay, your hair is tubes. There's evidence that DNA takes the form of tubes, right? If you think about the, when you look around the world, what you're seeing is a bunch of straight and curved lines, right? It's the masculine and feminine. When they come together, they make a spiral. The human energy field is said to be a toroidal field, like a spiral. So what is making people sick, right? When one of your tubes gets cut, when one of your tubes gets smashed, that's an injury. But mostly what we're suffering from is tubes in trouble, right? Your tubes got congested. You breathed in bad air or some poison, something poisonous. You ate the wrong food. What happened? Your arteries started to get plaque in them. The plaque is there to protect. The body's not stupid. See, here's the problem. You go into the pharmaceutical industry and you say you've got a symptom, they think, oh, your body's doing something wrong. We'll give you a drug to make the symptom go away. No, your body's intelligent. If you get a fever, it's increasing the heat so that your metabolic processes speed up. If you've got a running nose, you should not be taking an anti-congestion to stop your nose from running. That's your body's intelligent flush mechanism to clean out your tubes. So. You ate the wrong food, you got um, constipation. That means you're reabsorbing waste matter from, 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 you, from your unfully processed crap. You got an infection, why? Your cells were full of garbage and the, the bacteria, it's not the germ, it's the can underlying condition of the body upon exposure to the germ. Can the germ come in and say, oh, there's lots of tasty food for me here to eat in this person's cells. They're trying to help you. They're eating your crap, literally. So I believe if we can help, all of your cells have the same functions as your body. They breathe in and they breathe out. More oxygen, learn to breathe properly. They, they, they poop, just like your poop, more water to wash the garbage out of your cells. They need, what do they need? Amino acids, they need vitamins, they need minerals. The, the doctor comes in and the, the, with the drug and, and your cells are saying, Where, I, I run an oxygen drug, I run a water drug, where's your amino acids, where's your, where, where's your vitamins, where's your minerals? I don't have any. Then why are you here, drug? Oh, the pharmaceutical company told me to be. So when we begin to identify the basic needs of the body, we give the body the building blocks of healthy cells, which make healthy tissues, which make healthy organs, which make for a healthy body. And then we remove anything that ought not to be in the body. That means juice cleanse. That means water fasting. That means uh, take a break from dry food, which is rehydrating you. Lots of fruit, vegetables, hydrate the body from the inside all the way through the tube. And by that way, we can step away one by one out of the pharmaceutical model. And by making us more healthy and vibrant, people go, what did you do? And then we can spread this knowledge and then all that money that's going to the pharmaceutical industry, we can start to redirect, create healing process, places to teach people about this stuff. And you don't have to wait around for the politicians or the lobbyists, stop watching the advertiser on TV, turn around, walk away. And that's the manifestation that Derek has been talking about. Like, fuck Minister Buller, sorry, fuck Minister Fuller. I was just testing to see if you were paying attention, said, you never change the existing system by fighting it. You change it by building the new system. And I'm so thankful 
to you all and Derek and all the speakers here because they see the way as we do, which is you can't control all external events. We change the world by changing ourselves. So please um, download my free ebook, sevenpharmamyths.com. I've got a few copies of my previous book here, not many, but please buy them because I don't want to have to carry them off <laughs> uh, to around Mexico. And um, I'm actually, a, this is my other job. I'm actually a psychotherapist, counselor, coach. And um, if that's something you, if you like my personality and that's something you'd be interested in, go to beyourselfandloveit.com and you can book a consultation with me and we can talk about, because it's, it's all interrelated, isn't it? The physical, mental, and the energetic flow to the cells. We all said there's three main causes to disease. Toxins, something's in your body that shouldn't be. Deficiency, um, you need something to build your cells that isn't in there. And then there's the psycho, social, emotional energy flow to the cell, which is where I started. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I hope to speak to you guys later. In 2020, as the World Economic Forum announced their vision of a great reset for humanity, the Freedom Cell Network responded by launching The Greater Reset, a five-day worldwide activation focused on inspiring the people of the world to build an alternative vision for 2030 and beyond. Our vision is one that respects individual liberty, decentralization, localization, and people-powered solutions over technocratic control. Our first activation launched in January 2021 as hundreds gathered in Texas and Mexico and thousands tuned in online at the height of lockdowns. The Freedom Cell Network gathered once again in May 2021 for the Greater Reset expansion as we broaden the horizons of our movement. In January 2022 and January 2023, we returned with integration and co-creation, rooting ourselves deeper by integrating the vast knowledge being shared and setting our intentions on co-creating the 2030 of our dreams. Now, the Freedom Cell Network once again presents the Greater Reset 5 Manifestation in Morelia, Mexico from January 17th through the 21st, 2024. Join us for five days of community, solutions, celebration, music, education, and liberation. The Greater Reset 5 will include more than 40 top-notch speakers from around the world, live music from our conscious community, hands-on workshops, kids and family activities, and whatever else you can dream of. Join us in Morelia in January 2024 so we can collaborate and build the parallel systems of the future. Join us for the next evolution of the Greater Reset Activation. Join us for the People's Resets. Visit thegreaterreset.org to learn more.